standing here in the Institution of Civil Engineering in front of the ICE 200 exhibition, which has lots of fascinating civil engineering projects. I came into engineering to be able to create a career which combined my curiosity as an engineer with the opportunity to address social inequity. And if you're going to make an impact, then you have to work in engineering that addresses the opportunities of our age. Cities, sustainable environments, rapid economic change, and computational and digital evolution. The Orisund Crossing is one of the most significant and impressive infrastructure projects of our age. And the impacts it's having go far beyond the success that was envisioned at the time that it was first thought through. This mega project hasn't just connected communities, it's transformed the communities within reach of the bridge. And it's also changed behaviours and unified Scandinavia and Europe. The Orisund Crossing is located between Denmark and Sweden, between the cities of Copenhagen and Malmo. It crosses the, the mouth of the Baltic Sea and the North Sea and connects those two water bodies together. The project has a very, very long history. It moved from folklore to serious intent in 1936 and the decision-making process to get it built was far more complex than the actual construction. The Swedish and Danish governments debated the issue, they discussed the locations and finally in 1991 after many financial crises, wars and global events they signed the agreement that led to the construction that we know and that we see today. The primary motivations for the crossing were to improve transport links in Northern Europe from Hamburg to Oslo as part of the Trans-European Network, to start to create regional development around the Orisund as an answer to some of the intensifying globalisation processes that were starting to affect Sweden's competitiveness, Sweden's decision to apply for the membership of the European Community and then connecting the two largest cities of the region which were both experiencing real economic difficulties. And then finally, improving communications to the Kastrup Airport, the main flight transportation hub in the region. The crossing is staggering in its scale. The whole crossing is just short of eight kilometres. The bridge is 204 metres tall. It has a shipping clearance of 57 metres with a cable stayed main span of 491 metres. The bearings alone separating the substructure and the, the, substructure and the superstructure are capable of resisting 96,000 kilonewtons vertically and 40,000 kilonewtons horizontally. Then the cables have compression spring dampers to deal with vibration. It's a very sophisticated structure. Then the remainder of the bridge is made up of 140 metre girders on concrete piers. The statistics themselves are incredible, but then when you consider that virtually all of the bridge was prefabricated, with the exception of the main towers. It takes on a whole new dimension. The bridge carries four lanes of traffic across a deck of 23.5 metres and two heavy freight rail tracks in a trough underneath the main deck. The need for the bridge to be stiff enough for rail was the main driver in cable state as a solution, rather than a more efficient and perhaps more mobile suspension bridge, which would have moved a lot more. Then for the last four kilometres of the crossing of the Sound, the road and rail go into a tunnel section. The reason for this was to prevent the Sound, which is the main connection between the North Sea and the Baltic Sea, from clogging up through ice flows in the winter, along with a whole range of key environmental concerns. The tunnel is four kilometres long, with three and a half kilometres of that submerged. And the crossover from tunnel to bridge occurs on a man-made island called Pepper Island. It's named to match the natural salt island which is nearby. The island was created from all of the arisings of the construction and it's worth noting that the dredging activities alone were incredibly environmentally sympathetic with less than 5% of the material that was dredged leaking back out into the sound. Like the bridge, the tunnel was prefabricated in sections, 55,000 tonnes each, the largest ever precast created at the time. Bridges and tunnels are engineering led and the most astonishing fact about the crossing is that despite delays for unexploded bombs and weather, the fact that so much of it was prefabricated on land meant that the construction was incredibly successful. How it was to be assembled, what we call design for manufacture now, was the overarching success story. Then the contribution to society has been profound. 
Originally conceived to be entirely funded by tolls, the government of Sweden and Copenhagen agreed to underwrite loans for the operating company to finance the project. Projects like this have not just defined the success of local communities adjacent to them. The Orison Crossing has changed the relationship between Scandinavia and Europe with significant long-term economic benefits. It took a long time to get there, but this project is truly transformational in strategic ambition, in design, in construction, and now in its contribution to the future of the region. Engineering on a mega scale really can and does create lasting economic success. This is a great example of that. I've had a fantastic varied global career, and I would encourage all of you to come and join the civil engineering profession.